as you as you may have noted, we've we've changed our plans a little. We're we're running with uh, some improvisation at the end of the day here. Uh, and since you already all heard from uh, the game makers uh, in the earlier panel, and also because I think um, that discussion was deeply emotionally exhausting for all of us, um, we've. <laughs> We've um, decided to take advantage of some of our esteemed uh, guests who come uh, quite a long way to attend uh, the conference and the exhibition. So in addition to uh, John and Christian, we have added to this final panel uh, Harvey Smith, who you may know from uh, Origin Systems, from uh, Looking Glass, from Iron Storm, games like Thief and Deus Ex and System Shock. Um, and more recently, uh, what was the name of your recent iPhone? Uh, well, Karma Star was the iPhone Karma side Star, project, yeah. and I'm currently collaborating with uh, Raphael Colantonio at Arcane. And the thing I'm best known for, I think, is being lead designer of Deus Ex and working on that series also. Yeah. Uh, and then Rich Lemarchand, uh, a game designer at Naughty Dog Software in Santa Monica, which is just released or recent, most recently released uh, Uncharted 2, which has been widely praised. And what are you working on now, Rich, that uh, you can talk about I publicly? Unannounced project. Unannounced project, oh, yeah. yeah, that pro I work on this project a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. Everybody makes the same game over and over again. We often hear that uh -huh. in the game industry, and it's true. It's called Unannounced Project. Yes. It's this vast collaborative project that will eventually result yeah. in uh, the end of all human problems, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so the, 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 the upside, or, or whatever you'd like to say, of um, changing the panel format is that I got completely thrown off, and uh, I had prepared a number of, of interesting and, and provocative questions for the other panel, um, which are now, now pointless. Uh, <laughs> so instead, um, I've, I've got a number of, of prompts and thoughts. Obviously, um, I'm happy to hear all of your reactions to the whole event, and then we'll, we will have some time for questions. But I want to start um, just by continuing uh, this, this conversation about curation and games a little bit with, with two um, two questions for, for you, Christian. First, I think that there are many people, not, not just those in the room, maybe less so those in the room, but those in the broader um, uh, world, who would look at many of the examples, perhaps most of the examples that, that you've shown, and say, well, it's, it's, it's an interesting piece, or it's, it's based on game technology, or it, it has an, a, a provocative, challenging relationship to games, but it's not really a game, whereas, um, we don't necessarily have that problem in new media art precisely because new media art is maybe a less structured or, or maybe it's a more open term. And we also, I mean, I'm overgeneralizing, but uh, we don't tend to have that problem with photographs or paintings, for example, that uh, th their, their status as photographs and paintings is not often um, uh, questioned. So, I mean, is that, what do we make of, of that question? Is it important or what does it tell us about this problematic relationship between the game world and the art world. Um, what do you think? Uh, I'm not sure if I agree with your assessment of the situation. First of all, photography it took photography 100 years to be accepted right. into the art world. You know, Those questions were constantly being asked. I mean, where's the art? You just press a button mm -hmm. and it's just depicting reality. It has nothing to do with art, um, et cetera. New media art, um, again, the question I get um, most is still, why is it art? You know, why would it be art? People you know, mm -hmm. struggling are struggling um, with that. And then, again, I see the difference between um, fine art and the art in games in, um, in general. That may be something um, a little bit more tricky, I think, because Again, uh, uh, there can be a lot of art in the um, in the design, in the sophisticated world, in the mechanisms of a game, but it's still um, a very racist, sexist shooter in which you kill vaguely Arab-looking uh, terrorists and so on. And none of you would probably claim that this is a great piece of art or should be in a gallery although the world may be really sophisticated and there may be a lot of art in the, in the elements. So I think it's all a matter of criteria. I mean, what I define as art, and that's not, art cannot be defined. You know, Duchamp would say, declare it to be art, then it is art. Um, is still this aesthetic or critical engagement. I think all of the examples 
um, I've shown, let's keep the mods even out of the picture, but the playable games, they show um, some critical engagement with um, structures of society mm -hmm. and the work you're doing and many of you um, are doing that puts them into the art um, category um, versus um, the conventions of a shooter. And again, I'm not discriminating um, against that. You know, that's great. Only does it have to be art? And on what level would it be accepted as art if it's not the graphic arts crafts okay. aspect of it? Let's, yeah, if I can pick up on that a little bit. One of the, one of the themes through uh, many of the examples that we've seen, including some of the new ones um, that you presented, have to do with this this idea of manipulating the game as system, mods are like this. Um, you know, th th some a game is taken and something is done within it. It could be performative or experimental. And it struck me that that this idea of using the game itself or the platform with a game upon it as a kind of a medium actually m may have something in common in a weird way with a lot of conversations we have in the game design community. I mean, uh, all 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 of the rest of you guys have have dealt with this this value, let's call it, of trying to enable uh, sort of player creativity in, in the design space. Um, but yet it still seems to me that there is kind of not necessarily a meeting of the minds there, that a, a, whether it's a mod tool, whether it's uh, someone making a, a new level for Doom, whether it's a particularly unexpected emergent uh, uh, decision tree in uh, Deus Ex, that there, there still seems to be some kind of um, uh, difference between them, or maybe, maybe, but maybe they're all the same. Well, I see differences um, probably also on the level of engagement with the medium. Whenever a medium is relatively new, and you know, within the larger history of art, you could call video games relatively new, there is this engagement with form. Um, what did Pike do? He put a magnet onto um, a TV. You know, he disrupted signals of the video. It was all struggling with what is this electronic image? What are we talking about here? And I think that's what Saad is about. That's what many of Jody's modifications is, are mm. about. But that's not necessarily what you would do as a game designer. You take it for granted to do, you know, to create your game, to do some content. You're not engaging um, on that level. So perhaps that kind of experimentation is an early phase. Of, mm. uh, I mean, Harvey, I'd be curious to hear what you think about this from the perspective of those, the kind of games that you've worked on. Yeah, um, I think I've always had this, uh, incredible optimism about uh, our fields, our fields uh, with, a, with an S. Um, just because I know game developers and game designers, you know I mean? Like we all played uh, hide and seek as kids or we played doctor or we played, you know, army or whatever, right? And then the night of my 11th birthday, I played uh, Dungeons and Dragons for the first time. And, you know, I played Rogue or NetHack at, for the first time at a certain point and started exploring these systems. And at times it would be a group activity, and at times it would be a very, like, internal, uh, almost isolating experience. But the consistent thread through my life is the pleasure of exploring and finding this this interaction or this form of pleasure that the that the game design team has, like, you know, they've crafted a structure that I'm moving around within. Um, so it is always about me as the player, right? And it's always about you as the player. And so when we've set out to do different projects, like working with Warren on, on Deus Ex and, and Invisible War, uh, and watching my mentors and friends work on similar, similar games, like we're really just thinking about a particular kind of experience. You know, we're, we're like, oh God, I remember that moment in such and such game where it was too dark to see and I wasn't sure if the enemy had seen me or not. And I could kind of tell in the background there's this analog system where they may or may not have perceived me, and I have some tools and some verbs for like staying out of sight. And there's a sublime tension. Does he see me? Does he not see me? What can I do here? Can I break that window? Can I get on that roof? Can I get there? Or is that out of bounds? So I, I don't, I mean, there are 90% of video games don't turn me on, but those types of games, like most recently probably Far Cry 2 or, or Bioshock, those games, those are the most meaningful creative experiences I've had. There are novels and films, obviously, that are very meaningful. There's music that's very meaningful to me. But my whole life has been in, in pursuit of this experience as a player. And I, and I feel fortunate to be a, a designer to work around those things as well. But to circle back, I've just always had this optimism because I know game developers and I know game players, and they're incredibly smart, incredibly passionate, 
And it's a very plural set of fields. So I've always had this optimism that somebody is going to be smart and creative around a commercial channel, and someone is going to be smart and creative around, uh, you know, modeling fight or flight, you know, like channeling their early abuse or like uh, sharing a beautiful, like if you played flower, just sharing a sensation that, that really no other medium can. Um, I remember as kids, we would tear up giant cardboard boxes behind supermarkets and then slide down giant grass hills on those cardboard boxes coated in wax. And it's like we would then come up with rules. We would come up with like, if you can land on this mattress at the trash heap at the bottom of the hill, then you, I'll buy you a Coke or whatever. You know, it, it, it's just like if you're a game player and you're a, a game designer or a, uh, somebody who's interested in games, I think, uh, I think it's hard not to share that optimism that, that many different channels are going to emerge as wherever there are smart people trying to express something, whether it's about a sense of power or mastery or whether it's something more subtle or, you know, their experience with gender or, or culture, you know, uh, I, I just have this optimism that uh, it's, it's a plural activity by definition because there are many different people engaged in it and it's just going to advance over time. And, the last little point is I, I even today after 16 years in the game industry, I'm 43 years old and I got into games at, at 93, I still have trouble articulating, even as a game designer and a writer, I still have trouble articulating this sense that I get from playing different games, like the feel of a game that peop people talk about and the like tension of working with the system. Jason Rohrer and I were talking earlier about games where you only see with your view cone, a game like XCOM back in the 90s where at the edge of darkness you don't see enemies and then when you turn there's the enemy and it, it, it's very hard to put into words this, the way this touches all these parts of, of your brain but I always have this faith that when I'm talking to game people they know what I'm talking about. Mm. Yeah, Rich. Oh, so, so what I see, hear you say Harvey, um, to, to mirror it back to you for a second is that part of what's most compelling about this form or these, these group of forms is that they're systemic and, and dynamic and that's something that excites me very much too. Um, but also that they are constrained in some way and I think that in the great multiplicity of works that we've been discussing uh, here uh, and that the, um, uh, that the Art History of Games Symposium has commissioned uh, is this uh, um, where, where the artistry really exists is in the tension between those two things, between um, freedom and constraint. That's where you have opportunities to both empower and manipulate in ways that um, allow for critical engagement and that allow for um, provocation of emotion without being on the nose or direct or didactic. And I'd, um, I mean, I'm not a, an art critic or an art historian, but I wonder, Christiane, if that's what you see there as well? Yes, ab absolutely. And I was actually, while you were talking, I was um, thinking about hearing um, Warren talking about Deus Ex and actually saying, we're trying to, <laughs> to create this great exploratory experience and this really terrific world. And we test with people and what do they do? They run down the middle path and shoot everything that comes at them. You know? And so when you describe your uh, favorite experience, that would be the exact same for me. You know? And that makes it rewarding. And perhaps we're all struggling with the same level of audiences, you know, the people who are just not um, valuing yeah. Yeah. You know, that complexity and uh, you know, who just don't get it, be I it art or be it a game. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's that. Uh, the fact that there's always multiple channels in, in some of my favorite works. I mean, I, I talk about Lunar Lander off and on because it's, it's like the marriage in a sense that it only thinly has this uh, veneer of content. You know, the name is an integral part of the marriage, which I think is just brilliant. Um, I think Chris Hecker or John Blow or somebody recommended it to me the first time, and I, I was so moved by this, the simple abstract, you know, pink and blue colors and, and the name. But Lunar Lander has about that much fiction and it's all analog input, you know, it, it, it's amazing to play with. But a lot of the games we're talking about here, they have many different ways that, that you can approach them, which I see as a huge win. And the, the very first time we watched someone play Deus Ex, I mean, we, we did have the problem of like, some people playing very hardcore in one direction and some people playing very hardcore in another, but the very first time we really watched somebody, they started out on the dock in New York, the, yeah, yeah, the, the boat, you know, like, had parked there and, they just 
took the trash can and threw it in the water and then like pushed a box around and then tried to chase the seagull that was at the edge of the dock and then fell into the water on top of the crate that was floating there and messed with it and then swam around looking at the fish. And I remember some of the people in the room, I don't remember who, uh, it might have been me for all I know, but immediately we had this discussion later where we thought, oh my God, we failed. Uh, because s no one ran down the pier, had the conversation, got into the fight, solved the puzzle, went and unlocked the door. And, but, but later, in retrospect, we were like, man, this is what we like. Uh, you know, this school of, of the specific school. It, it's far less polished than something like Uncharted 2, which is brilliant in its own, its own direction. But, but yeah, that exploration, uh, the fact that it's self-paced. Uh, there, there's one of my favorite games of all time is Doom 2. And it's, it's the speed and the aggression and the visceral, you know, fight or flight fear kind of response. But, but there's something beautiful also about these games that you can just fuck with, frankly. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, it seems like that, that kind of patience and just the time that it takes to do that exploration is maybe always going to resist the museum and the gallery for the reasons that you were describing. You know, the, the amount of time that someone spends or the, the social context that they're, that they're expecting. Um, I mean, changing gears a little bit, um, if I can pick up on the, the problem of kind of the understanding of, of, of a changeable 3D perspective, and, you know, we have this, this in invention of perspective in the Renaissance, and this becomes familiar in painting, and then, you know, cinema um, uh, establishes the, the, uh, the, the movement of that perspective, but it's always controlled by the camera so that the, the viewer doesn't have to do anything to encounter it. And one of the things I heard you describing, Christiane, I, if I understood correctly, was a, that that particular move, that, that move to real-time 3D graphics with a, an, a movable perspective is a real sticking point in, in your world. Um, and I, I thought um, immediately of a, of a conversation that, that John and I were having yesterday about the invention of uh, the movable camera, the mouse movable camera in, in Quake. And I wondered if you'd be willing to kind of tell that story a little bit to make a connection between those. Um, so uh, yeah, when when uh, you know like the earliest two D games that I had that I had worked on, um, you know the camera was the center of the screen, and we just kind of moved the world around the player. Um, actually, that was a little more advanced. The the earlier ones were the world is on the screen, and and that's pretty much it. And then you know the next level of that was move the character to the edge of a screen, and then the screen changes, so you feel like you're in more of a world. Then we go to full scrolling, smooth, you know, panning motion for uh, the Commander Keen games, and um, the camera's still the same. It's just the the environment moves better. And then, um, and then when we went to uh, to create Wolfenstein, we kind of kept the the camera on on a uh, one plane, and that was mainly technological because to do any kind of vertical movement would have required a lot more programming and. And the game wouldn't have been as fast. There just wasn't horsepower enough to, to power the game to to look up or down because, you know, rendering perspective correct textures is is very expensive. So, um, so we just kept it on on one plane, and that actually, you know, the the game was played entirely on one plane. The the hallway was, you know, there were no stairs in Wolfenstein. Um, so we focused on speed in that game, and then when we go to Doom. Um, then we introduce our heights. You know, we have we have different height floors and ceilings, and and we can create more of a space for you to explore and to feel like you have a, a better contrast of experience through the world. Um, but we still kept the the camera on that same plane for the same exact reason. We were optimizing for purely vertical walls and and ceilings and floors that were at a, the exact same angle, so we could continue to deliver the speed, but also we could deliver lighting effects and stuff like that. Um, and uh, because we knew where we had the camera, we were taking advantage of it in our design of, of our worlds by putting putting uh, enemies you know, or rewards just out of the view of the camera. And, and when we were designing our levels, we would go to every single edge of something and make sure that you could not see it, or maybe there was a pixel we would allow to be viewed or, or something, just to let the player who's actually Either they're going to take a leap of faith off of a off of an edge to to see what's down there, or if they're going to you know investigate as much as they could. Um, and then um, when we then when we went to to Quake, that was our dedication to creating a fully 3D six degrees of freedom engine where we could look all over the place, straight down at your feet, straight up the sky or the ceiling, 
Um, and with that kind of camera movement, um, you know, we still had the idea that, you know, the camera is controlled by the, the game code. So just like the, the, the camera was controlled by the game code in, in Wolfenstein and Doom, it was always on the same plane and the player couldn't do anything but turn left or right. Um, with Quake, we allowed the player to turn left and right and everywhere that you went, the camera, we put a lot of code in there to, to basically make the camera look up and down any angles that you would possibly go you know, up. Like if you were going upstairs or downstairs or something, you could get to the edge of a ledge and it would look down for you. And, um, and after playing the, playing the game enough, uh, you know, it just didn't seem like that was the answer. The answer wasn't to like have the computer control every aspect of your uh, interaction in the environment. And, and so we introduced, you know, it was almost like, all right, Turning left and right is very well understood by the by the game player of an FPS at this time. So let's introduce the up and down as well as the left and right and just give them a full six degrees of movement and they can use the arrow keys or the WASD keys to move around inside the world and see if they can handle the, the two the two choices of mm -hmm. moving and looking. And uh, and that end ended up being like the best way of, of allowing players to look through the world. And now, you know, now you play World of Warcraft and and you can run and you can move the camera in front of your player and look at it while it's running towards the camera and just do all kinds of, of full, you know, camera control and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and know, John, everyone's used to it now. Did you guys have any sense at, at the time um, that you were working on what would become such a fundamental part, perhaps the most fundamental part of this emerging interactive literacy? Because, I mean, the mechanic you described is prevalent yes. across so many games, right. across so many different genres, including the one that, you know, both Harvey and I work in. Did you guys realize that you were creating a whole new language, basically? Well, um, I mean, for movement through a game, yeah, because when we were creating, you know, when I was basically um, s setting up the key controls for, for the FPS, um, you know, that was, that was something that I was going to carry through all of our games. And any games that that that, uh, that we worked on, Heretic or Hexen or um, any of those games, yeah. you know, I, I just continued the same key arrangements. So we're we're defining the, the keys that people are going to use um, using the mouse, the mouse, the keyboard, um, and uh, and people started copying that same the same keys because they were used to playing games that way, and it just really helped standardize that kind of control. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, when when we made Wolfenstein, you know, we knew that that our focus on speed. We thought that that was a better that was a better way to deliver our entertainment than um, like Ultima Underworld, which tried to introduce six degrees of freedom maybe a little too early. Um, but it was an RPG, so it was kind of okay to, to do it at that time. But w we were all yeah. about speed. So, so yeah, one of the things that fascinates me about this this story of the the evolution of 3D perspective, really in 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 real time graphics and games. Is that it's it's an art historical problem really, and I can I can imagine, uh, you know, it's a kind of a curatorial problem where you could see it through that lens where you take, um, you know, traditional perspective in painting and then, you know, show how it, it evolved and changed um, through uh, examples like the games uh, that, that John just mentioned. So, if I can try to connect that to um, Christian to your, the challenges that you were describing of of dealing with the the museum and gallery world and kind of the the fact that there's not a common there's not a common language or a, a familiarity with these conventions. I, is it actually just art historical work, fundamental art historical work that's actually required in order to facilitate those conversations? I don't know if it's art historical. Um, I think it's really more literacy. You know? Literacy of um, understanding visual spaces. It's a kind of visual literacy that is uh, required to wrap your head around this. And ultimately, um, I mean, it's surprising to me that it is such a um, stumbling block, um, but ultimately what you recreated is not existed before in cameras, right? I mean, you basically, what you did step by step is um, actually make possible what uh, a movie camera could do and more, you know, through player interaction. Um, the element of embodiment is also incredible. Um, incredibly uh, important here, I think, because having uh, wielding around a physical movie camera uh, needs to be translated into mouse keyboard um, mm -hmm. interaction of moving 
um, an avatar through yeah. space, you know. And all of these conventions are uh, not really understood. I mean, it, when I heard you describing all of these steps, I know most people would just completely miss right. out on that. You yeah. know, they don't even know what it took. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, and all of that creates uh, a problem. And it's the same for you know aspects of digital mm -hmm. art. You know, of um, right. data visualization yeah. of how data is processed and can be processed right. in visual spaces. I, mean, I suppose what I'm wondering is if the the art world has uh, a, there's a challenge or a responsibility that we could place on the art world to do some of this explaining. You know, a, as I've been. I've spent a long time in the past couple of years looking at the, the Atari VCS from a similar perspective, you know, kind of, how, how are all these non-obvious ways that the, the constraints of the machine and the desires of the creators and the marketplace and all of these things create constructed convention. And it's, it seems to me that it's, literacy is certainly a part of it, but the reasons why decisions get made and how they evolved um, in the, it's not just the creator makes a, a kind of decision, but there's a negotiation between material and, and, and form and all that sort of thing. And I mean, would that sort of would that sort of exercise be easier to sell into the art, um, the museum, and, and uh, than the artifact itself? Like here is an explanation of, you know, how the how the first person shooter came into existence, rather than here's Doom, and you can play with it if you want to. Well, I don't. You know, there's Doom, and Doom is the work ultimately. So <laughs> it shouldn't be the explanation of the work, but it just occurred to me while you were saying that, that perhaps there's not enough uh, literature about that. I mean, there's a lot about um, games and more and more, and more um, but there's still very um, few writing out there that really addresses um, these specifics of, of images, of image um, spaces. I mean, you have a, a lot of books on games, on game design, on um, you know how they fit in with the social, political, critical play context, and on and on. But not necessarily the art historical perspective of what is happening to the image here. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we need a. Lev Manovich has written a lot about these things when it comes to database and database um, aesthetics. And I think those are incredibly important writings that also apply to games to some extent. But perhaps there's a real gap here in terms of a discourse that needs to uh, happen. Mm -hmm. I don't, w I wouldn't put it on game designers or um, artists to actually try to explain what this image space is. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, um, the examples I've shown do that to some extent, but people still mm -hmm. are struggling with it. Well, I mean, John, you've been working on, on this sort of preservation uh, archival work and part of that perspective has come from conversations that you've been having with, with designers and developers to try to, I mean, this is where your, your opening keynote started, to try to capture um, some of those choices and, and conditions. And I mean, all, all of it, it seems to me, from you know, my knowledge of um, the medium, that not all of that can be seen from the game, from the, from the work itself, that it's, it's simply invisible to some yeah. extent. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it is like, there's there's the game that you can can see and you can play, um, but e I think even more interesting is actually how those things were made because there's there, it's there's just so much that goes into making a game, especially anything that's groundbreaking. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of work beyond what was around at the time, you know, in in thought processes that um, that are not the typical ones that, that you use to create a game, such as the um, using binary space partitions for the first time in Doom. Um, that was, you know, that was John Carmack basically trying to figure out how to speed up his, his uh, sector list traversal to render, you know, basically the, the scene. And um, he had been reading a, a white paper by a, a guy named Bruce Naylor, who was a researcher at Bell Labs, and his paper was about, um, you know, basically taking a 3D model, say some a person, a head, or, or, or an actual 3D model of something, and, uh, and culling the, the polygons off the back face so you wouldn't be rendering all the stuff that you wouldn't see. Because um, early rendering was, was basically rendering all of the back faces to the front, so the fronts would always over, overlap, the, you know, overdraw the, the stuff in the back, so it would, it would, you'd have a full scene, but it's even faster if you can get rid of those polygons that are in the back. So the algorithm, or the, the um, you know, the, the I guess the algorithm that, that Bruce Naylor had come up with was just for like a 3D model of something, and uh, when John was reading about that, he, he figured out how to translate that into a level, how to make a level 
renderer with that same algorithm. Um, how to how to take a binary space partition algorithm and translate that into a program that could analyze a, a Doom level and then cut that up into BSP mm -hmm. and, and then speed up the rendering. Yeah. So yeah. just that one little piece of the story of creating Doom, um, you know, is, is I think really interesting. Because then you would want, if you were going to research this stuff, you want to go all the way back and talk to Bruce Naylor and ask him how he came up with the BSP. Because there's a you know, white paper mm -hmm. that he wrote, but how, what was he thinking when he came yeah. up with it? Yeah, I mean, it brings up another question, which is related to this problem of literacy, that of, of computational literacy. You know, that to, you know, when we, when we look at things, um, I mean, this is, ag again, another horrific overgeneralization, <laughs> but we, we tend to, when we look at things as art, we tend to look at them visually and situate them in a, in a tradition of images. It's not always true, but it's largely true. It's, I think that's fair. And that's, um, that's only the beginning of the story in some way. So, you know, is there, Christian, in, in, in our community, there's kind of constant discussion of, of this issue of, of computational literacy, procedural literacy, of how you make, how you, make um, how you culture an understanding of, of computation in, in a designer or, or, or a creator that's not simply a, a kind of, uh, you know, building of an engineer and an artist and a designer, and, and then you assume that they're gonna all work it out together and, and live in these separate worlds. Does any of that exist in the, the art world, the curatorial world, those conversations? Uh, yes, it does, although obviously it's always the fringes. I mean, it also exists a lot within the new media community. I mean, Casey Rears and Ben right. Fry and processing being part of it. I um, once did an um, online show at the Whitney called Code Doc, in which I gave artists an assignment to um, code um, the assignment connect three points in space uh, with an 8K main, you know, and we exhibited uh, the code first, and then um, basically you got through clicking um, on the code, you got to the actual work. What I m wanted to make clear is these different materialities. Right. I think this is so radically different from anything that has ever existed before, that artists write a mathematical um, description you know, of what the um, work is, and I try to explain that more. So mm -hmm. all of that is there, and there is even um, uh, Joshua uh, Kriza, who wrote one of the uh, essays for the New Media in the White Cube um, book, actually has been um, working on the curator software, which yeah. would actually be right. a software that curates um, source code. You know. So, I mean, there's a lot of engagement with that within the new media community right. or curatorial community, but I think it's tough. I mean, yeah. when I match it against reality, you know, I, d I don't have the highest hopes for, mm. um, you know, code literacy yeah. in the whole wild world, but it's, it's yeah. really important, I think. Although it's interesting that, that some of those artists uh, go to great lengths to include it in their works. I mean, uh, Casey Reese's um, generative visual art, he, I mean, he may print out as as static objects, but then there's all, there's this this code which you can not only run but also see and modify uh, through this open source system. Or I, I believe that I, I'm correct in in, in this uh, statement that Corey Archangel has detailed explanations actually of these of these ROM hacks, and you know you could go in and and uh, disassemble you know your own your own ROM and, and make those changes yourself or do do your own versions of, yeah. of that sort of thing. Um, okay, well let me I mean I have the there's a topic that I want to figure out how to broach, and I'm not sure how to do it, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take a swing at this. And it's, it's really about the, the question, um, Christian, that you ended with, sort of why would you want to even be a part of the art world, or would you, or how do you know if you do? And given that we have um, on this panel uh, uh, three uh, esteemed gentlemen who have really chosen a kind of commercial route primarily, um, which isn't bad or good, it just is, you know, it's, it's a different path. I wanted to try to explore that a little bit. and. I want to try to bring some of the conversation from yesterday about the avant-garde into play because it's, it strikes me that um, there's some truth to the assertion that contemporary art in general, including new media art and so-called game art or, or, or what have you, is still very much trying to, to exist in the, let's call it the traditional avant-garde, uh, that it wants, to, it wants to resist in a very particular way, it wants to be political in a very particular way, or it wants to explore formal constraints in a very particular way, and that there's an accusation that's sometimes leveled against that, uh, that world, which is that it's, which is, it's the accusation that Tale of Tales made earlier, in part, that it's just kind of a, uh, a pointless dead world. Um, there's, there's, uh, 
there's nothing left to take from it, and it's an echo chamber. Um, so, I mean, what would you guys say to the proposition that today's avant-garde is actually in commerce rather than in the gallery or the museum? Well, I would profoundly disagree with that. First of all, I, one point <laughs> I forgot to make is there is um, a difference between art and the art world. Everybody hates the art world. Museums hate the art world. <laughs> Curators do. Gallerists do. You know, uh, but that doesn't mean that I hate the art world. You know, it's disgusting in many ways. You know, but I love art, and I will always um, love art. And um, I think. Art is something that is defined at any given moment in time, and um, perhaps the most exciting art doesn't exist in the uh, museum right now. Although, as I said before, I would uh, actually like to make sure that it does and becomes part of that world. But, I mean, we're, we're living, I'm, I'm going to sound uh, very much like um, the traditional Marxist, but, um, I mean, we're living in such a, neoliberalist um, world that is really particularly in the US ruled by corporations, you know, to see um, commerce as the new avant-garde. If it, w if it would be radical commerce that really manages to turn the system inside out, then I'm all for it, you know, but nobody has figured that out yet, mm. so um, I would be resistant to the idea. Harvey? Yeah, it's, it's very hard for me not to see this um, as you know, the, the greatest art in the world is in the mind of the player. You know, I imagine like a person sitting down constructing an avatar in a game, uh, imagine with a very full suite of cosmetic and, you know, gender and style uh, options. And what's going through their mind, specifically what I'm talking about is what's going through their mind as they're making those choices. They're expressing themselves you know, a little darker, a little more villainous, or a little lighter, or, you know, how, whatever they're doing. They're doing some process, right? And it's just like a, a child playing with a, uh, for my, one of my GDC talks, I talked about this thing that happened to me when I was a little kid, I was like seven. My great-grandmother had bought me, like, over time, eight or nine action figures and dolls, and I had disassembled them and reassembled them into one figure, broken all six of the others and made one guy. Like he had Robin's little black mask and he had like some of Batman's tights with all the yellow shit torn off of them. And um, the point here is like the, you could focus on the end object and say, oh, it's, it's art. And that, that's largely what people do. They, they focus on the final, the painting or the, the action figure or the doll, the, the avatar in the game. But the process that the, that the player is going through as he's creating that as he's understanding it, as he's expressing himself intuitively or unconsciously, it's more true about games that that's what it's about. Like, I mean, not to, gen not to grossly generalize, generalize it here or attack art, but really, art has had a few hundred years, and what they've done is they've kind of like taken the final result from somebody like Jackson Pollock, and they've taken that away to the gallery and said, ah, this is the art instead of focusing on what was going through his mind and his hands as he was doing his thing. Uh, and games, this is why there's a struggle. You can't take that away. Like, it is at the end of the day about the player and it's about what's going through the player's mind as he's hiding in the shadows, as he's sprinting down a hallway firing rockets, as he's like customizing an avatar to make it a little more playful so that it meets his or her, you know, internal, internal vision. Yeah, but that's, um I agree, but that's also true for any piece of new media art, or most of them, you know. It's about process, it's about experience. And a lot of art in the 60s has been about that. Only the art world never, you know, accepted that. Myron Kruger wrote an essay called Response is the Medium a long time ago, and that's a, that is where one of the essences of um, new media art um, is, as games, you know. Yeah. Is, it, is it perhaps the, uh, the case that it's just that the continuity of the process between the creation of the work and the experience of work is more um, visible uh, in um, emerging media. Um, we can watch someone play a game and we can see the, the activities that are the result of their agency, but you couldn't see much by looking at me sitting brokenhearted in front of uh, Mark Rothko in the San Francisco MoMA in 1998, uh, one of my sort of fundamental um, uh, experiences of, of contemporary art. There was nothing much to see, you know, maybe a solitary uh, tear, but 
But, um, Stern English exterior. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Stiff. St I was <laughs> even in that moment. I was keeping a stiff upper lip, even in the face of all that profundity. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But uh, you know, um, uh, it would be easier to see. I think what was happening with me as I played, as I as I experience any one of the works that is my uh, avant-garde of the contemporary art games scene, whether it's. Um, um, passage or, or the graveyard or, or I, what have you. I think, um, I, I think I understand your point. I mean, I'm not an art history guy. I'm, I'm now, by the way, taking through Savannah College of Art and Design, my very first art history class, and it's, it's fascinating, and I feel tectonic shifts going on in my head all the time. But I, I think there is a little bit of a disagreement, um, actually. I get what you're saying about the 60s, um, but in that case, there was one person doing one thing that then ended up in a gallery, and there's a discussion about that. And in this case, the whole point, it, it's not one person doing something that, that results in an artifact. It is crafting a, uh, a system or a language that is then meant to be mass disseminated to people so they all have their own individual experience with it. But and that's why I think even if the art world didn't accept it back then, I think that's why it's undeniable now. Uh, I am actually only talking about that work, the work that tried to do the exact same thing, that cre tried to create a system for a participatory experience, obviously not mass dissemination at the time, but from Stephen Willards to you know, so many artists at the time, they did just that. And where, where are they in the history of art ra right now? You know? mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm talking about precisely yeah. that, not about the people who um, in the end created an artifact that resides in a gallery. Let's um, maybe open the floor to questions from the audience for the last uh, 10 minutes that we have. Those of you who are waiting before can now take your opportunity. Hello. I've um, been working with some high school students. We have some, a company named NeuroSky has created something called the Mindset. It, you wear it over your head, it measures, it brain, senses your emotions when you're in gameplay. So um, and it, it, there's just attentive side and there's a meditative side and it actually has a, uh, you know, you can tell um, when you're listening to music or um, it comes bundled with something called NeuroBoy. And NeuroBoy is a virtual 3D world in which you can levitate cars or blow them up or a magnet. But you can actually see what happens is without using the mouse or the keyboard, you actually be able to look and say, okay, this is the car I want to levitate in a row of cars and without touching anything, just by your sensor, by focusing, a flame begins and then the thing eventually blows up. Um, <laughs> and what's happening is we are able to now capture emotional bandwidth of games. Um, we're actually able to see what it is that makes our brains fire when we are listening to music, looking at an art piece, or in a virtual 3D world, or in a game. And I think this is a, a, a good way of um, sort of being able to understand emotions and understand what makes people respond the way they do, but we ha this is very early um, uh, technology and it's $200, so I think I'm gonna buy one. But um, you know, I think what's gonna happen is, I'm hearing people talk about it, but there's nothing quantitative. There's nothing easy, it's not very easy to, quanti you know, to talk about, so we talk about it in this very vague way, but um, when we want to figure out what makes um, people go see artwork, what makes them value it and makes them buy it, then I think this is the beginnings of seeing what that is and actually in a tangible way. And that's what I wanted to say earlier. So. Okay. Next. Hi, I just wanted to uh, extrapolate from uh, Christian's comments. Uh, I also hate the art world and love art. Um, I also love games and I hate gamers. <laughs> and I sometimes hate the game industry. Um, and I think it's important to register that. Um, however, I, I want to ask a question in the context of this, this idea of the democratization of experience that, that Harvey was speaking to. Um, because I think that it's, it's easy in the abstract to talk about how games have these unlimited possibilities to evo evoke uh, uh, you know, uh, uncircumscribed reactions, and, and that's certainly true, uh, and it's true of everything as well, uh, everything we do and everything we experience. Uncircumscribed. That's right, reaction. that's right. Everyone can respond to everything in any way, um, so it's kind of not very critical, right? 
Um, so, so my question is, how do you square that with the fact that there is this gamer culture that seems to be so bound up in a kind of groupthink, in a kind of very common, uninteresting, similar kind of reaction to their game experiences, and how predominant and how, how Im influential that is in the game industry? Can, can I have a quick bash at responding to that? I think that you're um, reacting to an extreme with another extreme. Um, I'm interested in this idea that um, that a, a designer can create something to which someone can have a wide range of responses um, which share many characteristics with responses to artworks. But I'm not so sure that it's unbounded, that it's completely unbounded. I think that that would be a weird kind of artifact. It would be like a matchbox that you opened and you would either shriek or you would laugh or you would giggle uncontrollably or start to cry. I mean, I guess that would be a good practical joke device, but I'm not sure that it would be an artwork. I think what's more interesting is the, the kind of works in, uh, you know, that, are, that have been commissioned where from each one of the, the four artworks that we've had the chance to experience, I have had the ability to have my, my own unique response. Um, but it's not unconstrained. The experience of 16 tons is very different from uh, the experience, the character of, in character from the experience I had from Jason's work. But I'm quite sure that the experience I had with Jason's work was very dissimilar uh, from the experience that even the person I was playing with it had, let alone other people that played it. Does that make... I, I agree with you. That's why, that's why I said I, I thought it was uncritical, you know, because I thought it didn't get at... Because constraints are, what's are what are interesting, right? What separates games from other things. That tension, yeah, between yeah, constraints and, I, I never, and freedom. I don't know if I'm the one who implied it, but I never meant to imply that uh, game designers are thinking you could approach uh, a, a given situation and do literally virtually anything, but they're but there is a wider range of, of responses. Sometimes it's three channels, sometimes it's 100. Um, and in that, you know, I, I, uh, I share some of your sentiments. And, you know, you said that seeing it that way would be uncritical. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's more mediated than that. I think, it, I think it's, you know, we, the first person I ever heard talking about democratization of uh, game design or, or of creativity was probably Doug Church, who's like my biggest hero in the game industry. I've learned more from him, and the guy's amazing. And uh, his his way of putting it was abdication of authorship, I think. Um, and that I, that might be a quote from Janet Murray or something. I, I don't know, but like Doug yeah. was the first guy was I heard talking about yeah. it. Is it. Was that true? Yeah, that's Doug. Yeah, that's Doug. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, but but in any case, like, I don't think even I'm channeling him here a little bit, but I, but I think he would also acknowledge that a game designer or a set of game designers are still mediating the experience to some extent. They're still imparting some part of them themselves in, into the work. You know, it's, uh, it's partial abdication, it's of partial, authorship yeah, or yeah, devolvement that's, that's of authorship. Can, can you like just that. speak to sorry? Just one quick. Well, I think we should we should move on because we really only have time for, for maybe we'll one more question. Often. I apologize. Um, one of the questions that seems to be coming up a lot over the last few days is how do we exhibit games as their art forms when they're so bound up in play? Um, the, the question of how do we show Doom? How do we show Zelda? How do we show these, these games that are landmarks and are art in and of themselves, however commercial they are? And um, it, occurs to, it had occurred to me Shouldn't we be looking at these kind of the way that they were originally exhibited? I mean, shouldn't we be building our exhibits based on, say, the arcade, based on the living room where we played these games together, where we experienced them, since the experience is what we're dealing with? This, is, this has bothered me through the entire conference, so can I just take a short answer? Sure, at it? Um, for it. So you probably know the story of, somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm also not a uh, violin theorist or anything, but like Joshua Bell, like one of the yeah. best violinists in the world, right? Uh, someone conducted an experiment a couple of years ago where they took like what is considered by some people the greatest piece of music. They gave him like one of the greatest existing violins. He is this... Yeah. His yeah. Stradivarius, thank you. Um, if, uh, Josh and they Bell put him in, they put him in normal clothes in like a train station or something, right? It was a metro station in A DC. metro station. Yeah, this is interactivity yeah, right yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's and, uh, right there. And so they basically 
how much of going and appreciating fine music is performative? How much of it is you tricking yourself into thinking, ah, this is fine music? And so I had this thought that you just articulated, like through the whole conference, I was like, man, you put on a certain set of psychological hats when you go to a gallery, clearly. Um, even if you're looking at an insulation piece that's a giant shark in a vat of formaldehyde, you're in, you know, you know, you're in some, you, you put on a different set of hats when you go to watch fireworks on the 4th of July, for instance. Those of us who celebrate that. But, uh, yeah, we tend uh, <laughs> not to, thanks. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, so I guess my last little point here is I had this thought while we were talking about this stuff in the conference that like, you know, the games I grew up loving are a little bit isolating. Maybe it was you and a friend in front of the TV on the carpet. Uh, maybe it was you alone in your room with headphones on and the lights turned out playing, you know, a game like Looking Glasses Thief or something. And it's like, there is a particular, I don't know if I'm articulating this well, but there's a particular performative role for the player where the player has to take on the right set of, you know, mental conditions in order to appreciate the work, the, the play the experience of play. And, and I don't think that's possible in a gallery where there are a bunch of people walking around afraid of saying the wrong thing or s afraid of being uh, uninformed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's much more likely to get a good experience playing poker around a poker table with guys that are, that are bluffing and gambling and drinking a little bit. And I think it's the same with games. And I, I think your point about the living room is, is great. Yeah, I mean, this is, has been one of the big discussions, particularly surrounding net art. Um, 15 years ago, that was the, you know, one of the main aspects, and many people would um, would have argued at the time, you know, oh, it belongs in its uh, natural habitat, you know, meaning, you know, you in your um, home living room kicking back with a can of beer and surfing the net, you know. But what that means, again, is that you're excluding this art from a discourse with other pieces of art and with other um, genres. And I believe that there is a way of effectively bringing it into a uh, gallery space, but the gallery space is a public space. It does not make sense to recreate your living room to play uh, Doom. And I think it makes uh, much more sense to actually create an environment that is inducive to playing, you know, and since it's a world that is immersive, you know, why not play with these elements? I mean, I would install Doom in a very different way. Um, in a gallery, and I've seen, um, unfortunately I don't remember which piece it was, um, but I remember seeing one game piece within one year in three different uh, locations completely differently installed. Once just on the computer monitor setup, and the last version was uh, at Chiasma in Finland as, you know, gigantic um, projections on glass walls and you just couldn't help engaging with it. You know, it was so inviting. All you wanted to do is mm. grab the joystick and go for it, yeah? It makes an enormous um, difference, and I think there is a way of displaying these artworks um, effectively in, a, in the public space of the gallery, you know, with re without replicating the home. Mm. I think, uh, it, I mean, I believe you, and I think it's, uh, but I think that consideration is very valuable, right? I mean you would have to think about the Hawthorne effect where people, you know, their mental processes and change when, as soon as they know they're being observed, right? Absolutely. So in a public space, you know you're being observed. Uh, one of my friends in Austin, Texas is Zach Simpson, who I'm surprised, I, I don't think he got mentioned uh, in the, the history of the, or the, the proceeds of the conference, but he does projector shadow art where people can come into a dark room and like hold up their arms and the, the, the silhouette, the shadow of their arm, a, but a shadow butterfly will land on the finger, you know, and the first time people see it, they're utterly fascinated. And if they move too fast, the butterfly flies yeah. away. And uh, I think the way his installations are often set up are conducive to interacting with a pond or a butterfly shadow or something. I'm not so sure that the tension of a stealth game or the uh, aggression and, and, and fear of a, of a first person shooter would map so well to that same environment. I want to keep us on time. I know that it's been a long couple of days. I apologize for those of you with questions. You can try to tackle the speakers uh, as they as they leave. Just a couple um, brief mentions before I uh, turn the program over to um, our closing speakers. Uh, first, I want to remind you that uh, Indicade and the IGDA Atlanta are hosting an after party at the W Hotel, which is where you're staying probably if you came from out of town for the conference. 
uh, which starts at 7 p.m. You can get into that uh, for free if you've attended the conference, and everyone in this room has done so. Um, also, uh, next week on Tuesday, uh, Local Developer Global Agenda is hosting a launch party for their game. Local Developer High Res is Studios is hosting a launch party for their game Global Agenda. Apologies, which um, you can attend at 6:30 p.m. on the 9th. There is more information about that on ggda.org. And then before I close down, I just want to thank uh, Christian Paul and John Romero and Harvey Smith and Rich Lemarchand, but also all the speakers and game makers who made this event. Uh, just exceed my expectations in, in every way. Let's give them a round of applause.